illnesses tested by the pulse. and drinking that affect your health. New research suggests that the amount of control you have over your work can affect it too. Ten years ago, this firm in Gateshead was in big trouble. In fact, it nearly went bankrupt. But then the management began to turn things around. Three years ago, they started trying to change people's attitudes to their work. At Bonus, they lead the world in computerized loom equipment for the textile industry. The company's success is partly due to a change in management style. We're now asking people to bring the brains to work and use them at work and not three or four or five years ago where we would come in and they would just use the hands. What we're asking, them, there's a bit more to the game now. We're ask, asking them to look at their areas of work, become problem solvers and use brainstorming techniques to improve the work. And now, although the job maybe is de-skilled from what it was four years ago, we're using a lot more of this now, a lot more thinking now. What they've done here is to split the workforce into self-managing teams or cells. They don't have supervisors anymore. Instead, team leaders work with their teammates on the shop floor, running the production line themselves. Hey, what a problem here. Stop the machine before it starts to cut. And right. It's too far this way, you know. Ah, oh, is it? Fred, we've got a slight problem here. I've stopped this machine. The idea is to push responsibility for the work right down the system. And the effect on people's feelings has been dramatic. Michael said to me, well, what do you need to produce this job, Fred? I'll say I need a new reel. How much is a new reel? It might be say, 60 grand. Um, the nearest I've come to, to spend that type of money is buying a house. So it's a big investment, you know. And um, 
I'm given the trust of actually going out, looking at the machines and seeing if that's what we want. But would you say your teams feel confident enough that, that they hold some kind of a power, that they can actually, you know, that they can put their words across and their voices be heard? I'm actually working uh, with my second team now, my whole original team. Uh, all ten people have moved on. They're all on a higher band of tape and they're all within different areas of the factory. You're not just coming to work, getting up in the morning and saying, well, I'm getting another eight hours in the day. You know, you're, you're involved. Um, I was off yesterday and, um, I mean, thinking about, well, getting back again, you know, getting the boat. So it's, it's good from that point of view. I mean, the, the time just flies. The people at Bonus certainly feel happier in their work, but are they any healthier? The new research shows that they probably are. It's easy to see how heavy lifting or working with dangerous substances can make us ill, but it's more difficult to determine the psychological effects of work on our health. But it can be done. For the last 20 years, scientists have been studying thousands of civil servants here in Whitehall. They're beginning to draw a map of the routes from work to illness, and their results are quite striking. The Whitehall study has been analysing the health prospects of British civil servants for nearly 30 years. And from the start, the focus was on Britain's number one killer, heart disease. As the numbers came in, they showed a surprising bias. The study divided the civil servants into four grades, from messengers and clerks at the bottom to the mandarins at the top. And it showed that people in the bottom grade were four times more likely to get heart disease than the people at the top. And there was a smooth gradient. As you went up the civil service, the danger declined. This is not about poverty. This is really about the hierarchy. It's about saying that the social structure influences our biology. Conventional risk factors, smoking, blood pressure and serum cholesterol, explained only very little of the differences in risk between the grades. What was it about the structure of the civil service which caused this? Eric Brunner and his colleagues suspected it was to do with the amount of control people felt in their jobs. So they measured this against the presence of fibrinogen, a blood clotting agent which can predict heart disease up to 16 years ahead. We got our civil servants to fill in a large questionnaire and amongst the items in the questionnaire was an evaluation of their work. Not precisely what they did, but how they felt they were treated and how they felt about their work. And what we found is that as job control levels rise, fibrinogen levels appear to fall. Job control's effect on fibrinogen is almost as large as the effect caused by smoking and drinking. So, unless people feel a sense of control over their work, they may be more at risk of getting heart disease. And there are other benefits. Days lost through sickness at work at bonus have fallen by nearly 50%. Although the changes here were made for reasons of profit rather than health, should every business be run like this? After all, this one's just been voted Britain's best factory. But for every employer who has taken the control message on board, there are plenty who haven't. And as a result, angry workers are turning to the law. There's always been the ethic, since Adam was a lad, really, that you were not supposed to moan. You put up or shut up, and that's always been there as far as I'm concerned. But I think management now, personally, is, is just out for the, the, the quickest book they can find. I don't think people have got loyalty to their employers anymore, no. Certainly not. Um, why should they, when, when they know damn well that they can be fired and another guy brought into their position? In the last three years, the number of people on short-term contracts has risen by 40%. It's the same for those working more than a 48-hour week. It all adds up to stress, 
and often managers don't realise how bad it can be. Mr Walker's lawyers said they'd now be seeking compensation for loss of earnings. But now, employees are beginning to fight back. Millions of workers could now benefit from the decision. The stress levels of workers, nurses, teachers, social workers, uh, you name them, are getting to a level where their health is being affected. I just hated going to work. I just hated that job. I just hated every body in management. Um, and I just wished I could get out of some of them and bash their heads together. It just got harder and harder. And there was many a time I'd burst into tears just at the thought of getting up in the mornings and going to work. As people left, they didn't replace and then it was put in more calls on to me. I had about 375 I think. It then went to 475 with flats. I did say I couldn't cope with all the extra work and um, I had some big bosses come down to see me from um, Litchfield and uh, all I got was it was rationalisation. I was getting in more and more stress because there was more and more work and that was because the management sort of insisted that you done more to make more money. So I do believe the job has done it. I went to Citizens Advice to start with and uh, they advised me to see the a solicitor and he said that it's very possible that I can sue the company and I have a very good case. Just over a year ago John Walker won the first ever case against an employer for psychological damage due to stress at work. So has it opened the door for other claims? I'm finding that people are more inclined to bring claims um, these days. I think there's less security um, and people, when they feel insecure, inevitably feel less loyal. Midlands Co-op confirmed that new rounds were merged with old ones, but said that the amount of milk Tony had to deliver didn't increase significantly. They also said that his union advised him to withdraw from an industrial tribunal. But Tony has decided to pursue his case through the courts. I think the overwhelming majority of the people that I see have genuine complaints. I very rarely come across a person who is actually inventing symptoms. Cases like Tony's are, are characterised by um, the changing working environment and the need for change to be managed properly. And I think in cases like Tony's, the reason why one might feel they could be successful is that the change was so poorly managed. As you know, we've got the witness statement of uh, Richard Farley. Yes. And we've got yeah. two people from Coventry who are prepared to sign witness statements if, if we want them to do so. Have you um, been in contact with Central Midlands? In order to succeed in any case of this nature, one has to show that there is a breach of the duty of care, the common law duty of care, and we're going to have to show in any case like this that the employers fa failed uh, to take reasonable care to avoid um, foreseeable risks of harm to the employee. What employers have to realise is that these employees are going to be very startled, very bemused by what's going on around them and their needs do have to be catered for in the reorganisation every bit as much as the needs of the business and a failure to do so is just going to be counterproductive for the business anyway. I think I'd like to see a strengthening of the law in this area. I'd like to see some regulation directly related to stress at work and a positive obligation on employers to carry out risk assessments to stop these problems occurring. In the tough modern world of competing market forces, just who should be responsible for our health at work? 
management, unions, governments, us. Most occupational health schemes can only pick up the pieces, they can help the victims, but they can't prevent work-related illness. Perhaps what we need in Britain is a completely new approach. After the break, a different attitude to health at work in Denmark. The fact that I've had an illness and I'm now well. Company or, or um, service time off. But when you come back again into the situation, nothing has changed. It's still exactly the same. Only one worker in three has access to a health scheme at work, and that's declining. And even then, schemes miss a lot of problems. That's why we set up our occupational health service here in Sheffield 15 years ago. And there's a huge demand for our advice. The way we reach people is by talking to them in GP surgeries. Frederick, do you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fifteen years ago, the main problems we dealt with were deafness and lung diseases caused by heavy industry. Ten years ago, we uncovered the first cases of repetitive strain injury long before it became recognized. Now we are finding stress, back problems, heart disease and cancer caused by work. Let's get on with the test. So what I do is I ask you to take the deepest breath you possibly can and huff the breath at the yeah, yeah, right, yeah, as fast as yeah. you possibly can, and I'll try to keep you going as long as you can. <laughs> carry on, carry on, carry on. Right, okay. Thanks. It looks to me as though you'd have a case for compensation. I think we should wait until we get the hospital yeah. report back yeah. to decide whether to go through with that. Compensation isn't the answer, though. It's very hard to get, and the sums are so small that employers don't feel the financial pressure to change things. I believe every occupational health service has got to concentrate on prevention. But how? I knew that Denmark has a great reputation for safeguarding the health of its workers. They take it very seriously. In fact, they spend twice as much per head on research as we do in Britain. So I've come to find out how their system works. The Danish occupational health services are called BSTs, and they look after nearly two-thirds of the workforce. And the most striking thing is they're completely independent. They're set up by the government, not the employers, and both management and workers have a say in how they're run. Fitz Nielsen set up the BST for Copenhagen's 7,000 council workers. He's an engineer, not a doctor. The basic philosophy as we named it uh, 15 years ago is that the patient uh, is the workplace, not the individual. Each BST has a team of specialists. Unlike us in Sheffield, they have access to workplaces. Either management or workers can call them in. That's a real difference. They offer advice on lighting, chairs, computers, the whole working environment, even on a better mouse. Six years ago, this hospital laundry needed modernizing. That's when the BST were called in. Where are these loaded? Ah, they load all the um, items here. Yeah. But in this group, the women move around from area to area yeah. in this area. And they rotate, yeah. yeah. In the old days, the work was heavy, hot and noisy. There were a lot of back problems and other injuries. Sonja Jepsen is on the Health and Safety Committee. So we had tongue lift. It was always very heavy work. We had to lift the clothes in and out of the trolleys, bending over, up and down all the time. It was very bad for our shoulders, arms and backs. It's
It's significant that the BST's first priority was the psychology of the workplace. They suggested completely reorganizing all the work patterns. We have regulations about doing these kind of jobs which uh, have a lot of, of um, what do you call it? Re repetitive work. Yeah, repetitive, yes. And they want, the Danish government have decided to, to, uh, to bring that down to 50% within all uh, in the next uh, five years. To reduce the amount of repetitive work? Yes. The BST and workers' representatives advised on buying the new machines. And workers even went abroad to see the equipment in use and to assess the environment they would be working in. A very important part of the, the whole design setup was to see how can we make sure that uh, the stress will not be too hard in, in, in our workplace. How can we make sure that the, we get machinery that will actually do the lifting instead of uh, us doing the lifting. And that has been totally redesigned uh, and, and it's much more efficient now, but it's also much more healthy. This is a job which was traditionally done by by stretching or by, by, by two persons or by yeah. one person stretching it out. That is more light yeah. and it's air, ventilation, as you see them in airplanes. It's just again a possibility to make the working station more personal. You can, yeah. you can adjust your situation. Yeah. Yeah. The new system has been a great relief. And of course, now there's more light, the whole environment has become better. It used to be very stuffy, now it's much cooler. They have new noise levels from steam compressors and so on. But generally, it's become much less noisy to work here. But there's a clear limit to their powers. The BST had no say in the redundancies caused by the modernization. What they could do was make the new technology as safe and healthy as possible. It's a long tradition of cooperation between uh, employers and employees organizations. They try to negotiate to find compromises and that's probably one of the, a part of the Danish tradition is actually to make compromises. If you care for the staff uh, the health, not just the, the physical part, but also uh, uh, other parts of the systems. Um, I think you will have more efficient workers in the future. I'm really impressed by what I've seen in Denmark. Occupational health in Britain hardly exists for most people. Here it protects two workers in three. The system here in Denmark isn't perfect. What system could be? but it does have three vital qualities. It's independently funded, it's managed by workers and employers together, and it's backed by the force of law. This means that it can concentrate on preventing ill health, not just mopping up the casualties. The Danes aren't the only country in Europe to take occupational health seriously. The Dutch, the Swedes and the Norwegians have comparable schemes, but Britain lags far behind. So what will it take to make us change our ways? The financial case alone is compelling, both for employers and taxpayers. But the benefits of good health at work could so easily be there for us all. Next week, the Pulse delves into one of Britain's best kept secrets, the health of the nation's bowels. See you then. If you would like a free Channel 4 directory of organisations concerned with health and safety at work, please send a large stamped address envelope to PO Box 4000, London W5 2GH.